In the name of Jesus, amen. Trying to answer the who is God question is all but impossible. Whatever answer we get always comes up short. And we're not all that happy with that, are we? If there is a God, we want him to be nailed down and completely understood. We want there to be no mysteries involved, no place where reason and logic can poke their fingers in and say, hey, wait a minute, that doesn't fit with everything else. And that part over there, it leaves us with more questions than it does answers. But the problem is God appears to be bigger than all the tools that we have to measure him. The fact that we can't fit God inside our little containers troubles us. We don't like a God that's too big to be seen and too large to be understood. We would much rather have a God that's measurable, understandable. We would much rather have a God that answers all of our questions and answers them in the exact way that we want him to. But that's not God. And to fully unwrap the mysteries of the Trinity, it's a fruitless endeavor. The Apostles' Creed does its best job possible, speaking clearly and concisely of who God is. This confession is what God says about himself. It takes the scriptures and speaks God's words back to him and to each other. It summarizes them all in three little nice paragraphs. But the sinner is real good at finding a way to dodge around all those parts that still don't make sense. And that's why we have the Nicene Creed and the Athanasian Creed, each creed stamping out errors and heresies, false teachings and misunderstanding. These creeds have done well. They've done their job, but there's always going to be something mysterious left unanswered for how can the finite truly understand the infinite. And so perhaps the best place for us to look to understand the mystery of the Trinity is at the baptism of our Lord. For it's at his baptism that we truly get to see who God is and who he is for you. At his baptism, Jesus is the anointed one, anointed as the Christ. It is God in the flesh, taking on the form of a servant so that he can fulfill the long foretold prophecies of the Christ, come to save their people from their sins. From before the foundation of the world, the triune God dwelled eternally, always three, always one. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, present at creation, present at the fall of creation, present too at that very first gospel promise of an offspring from Eve come to crush the head of the great serpent. And now that offspring had come in the form of a virgin-born baby, all grown up and ready to begin his ministry of reconciliation and salvation. In the flesh, our God now dwells, walking his fleshy feet to the banks of the Jordan River, where he had once led his people those very many years ago. His namesake, Joshua, had brought the Israelites to that very same Jordan, maybe to that very exact same place, with the Ark of the Covenant, God's mercy seat, stopping up the raging current the people walked through on dry ground to the other side, out of the desert and into the promised land, out from slavery and into sonship. Now all those many years later, the very same God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is present in that very same Jordan, bringing the very same salvation to his very same people. But this time the Son is man. God too at the very same moment, but in every respect man except without sin. And it's that without sin part that makes his flesh worthy to be anointed as the Christ. And the Christ must be man so that he can taste man's death because of man's sin. And that's why the Father declares that this Jesus is his beloved Son. That's why the Father is so very well pleased in his Son, for his Son has come to be the Christ, which means he has come to do the work of the Christ. At this point in time, there in the Jordan, There is no other reason why the Father is pleased with his Son, for he has come to save his people from their sins. God best shows who he is by showing what he does for us. He creates, he saves, he sanctifies, he makes holy. Jesus is the Christ, God's anointed, because he saves his people from their sins. But what does that even mean, and how does he even do it? 
For Christ is no mere blueprint of a life well lived, although his life is indeed an unblemished example laid out before us. And neither does the Christ free those in bondage by telling them that their chains don't exist. A Christ like that would be no Christ at all, more of a charlatan and a deceiver, more of a liar and a murderer. A Christ like that would have far more in common with the likes of the serpent who spins such deceitful and deadly deceptions than he would with the God of creation and salvation and sanctification that takes on our flesh and becomes man. No, a Christ, a true Christ, the true Christ, the second person of the Trinity incarnate in the flesh of man must deal with sins of the sinner in a real and complete way, treating them as their sins need to be treated, providing the salvation that needs to be done in the only way possible. And so at his baptism, we see Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, numbered with sinners, numbered as one of them and anointed to be their Christ. The Holy Spirit descends down upon him in those Jordan waters, for Jesus has now taken the sins of the world up upon his shoulders and is preparing to lug them to the very place where they must be ended. The Father speaks down from heaven, you are my beloved Son, because the eternal Son has now taken on flesh and blood and resigned himself to a sinner's death, a real death, an actual death, meant only for those who are under the curse of the law. As St. Paul says in Galatians, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. That is why the Father declares, with you I am well pleased. Because this son of his, this perfect God in the flesh, has bestowed upon us the greatest of blessings by becoming a cursed man with the sins of the world placed upon him. He is on his way to the cross, anointed to bear the sins of each and every single one of us, all the way to that tree of death. The father is pleased with the son because he is going to curse his son as a damned sinner remove his fatherly face from his son so that he can make his fatherly face shine upon us and be gracious to us. The father is pleased with his son because he is going to go to war with sin and death in the body of his son as he hangs on that cross so that his fatherly face once again can be shown upon us so that he can say we are his sons and daughters. Give to us his peace because our sins have been nailed through his anointed one. Earlier in Matthew, in Luke 2, John the Baptist makes reference to the differences between his baptism and the baptism of Jesus. And true to form, he explains how his is less, his points forward to, alludes to this greater baptism of Jesus. John baptizes with water, but Jesus will baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And that fire business, it sounds scary. It sounds as if it's going to hurt and it isn't going to be all that pleasant. Who would even want such a baptism? But the fire is not meant to be dangerous or damaging or damning, at least not once it comes to us. In the Gospel of Luke, later on, Jesus speaks of the fire that must be kindled. This fire to come is the wrath of God that must consume the world because the world is fraught in sin. But Jesus also refers to a baptism that he must be baptized with. And no, that's not the one in the Jordan. It's another. He desires that this baptism was already upon him because it is in this baptism that he fulfills the anointing of the second. And the cross is this baptism. And at that cross, he will receive the wrath of God that is meant for the world. And he greatly desires this baptism, has desired it ever since he was cooing in the manger as a little infant, has desired it ever since the Holy Spirit descended upon him in the Jordan and the Father proclaimed his pleasure for him, has even desired it from before the foundation of the world. Jesus desires this cross, this baptism of his, because his cross means your salvation. And he baptizes you with the Holy Spirit and with fire, meaning that he baptizes you into his death. 
Jesus baptizes you and gives you his cross. Everything that he won for you when he became your curse, he gives to you as the Holy Spirit washes you clean in the holy waters of baptism. Triune God present once again, just like he was before creation. Triune God present once again, just like he was in the waters of the Jordan as Joshua led the people through to the promised land. Triune God once again, just like he was in the waters of the Jordan when the Holy Spirit fluttered down and the Father spoke pleasing words and the Son was anointed to be your cursed Christ. In your baptism, the triune God is present once again, placing his name upon you, calling you his son, calling you his daughter, telling you that he's pleased with you, not for your sake. Not because you've somehow joined yourself to the impossible to understand triune God. Not because you've been able to do away with your sin and change yourself from slavery to sonship. But he's pleased with you on account of Christ. His death, now your death. His resurrection, now yours. Your sin replaced with his righteousness. Your death replaced with his life. That's what it means to be baptized by Jesus with the Holy Spirit and with fire. He's become your Christ, and he has saved you from your sin. In the triune God, we see a never-ending circle where the three persons always point to the next. The Holy Spirit never points to himself, but always points to the Son, to the redeeming work of Jesus on the cross. And by the Holy Spirit, you see the Son who always points you to the Father, saying, you are a child of God. He is your Father, just as assuredly as He is mine. You're not a speck. You're not some cosmic accident. You are a forgiven son, a forgiven daughter. And then you get to hear your Heavenly Father point back to the Son and say, do you want to know my love for you? Hear what I said about Him at his baptism, and then look to his cross. That's my son. Listen to his words, what he says when he tells you that you are forgiven and you have life and that I am your father and you are my child. I know it's still all impossible for us to grasp this all-powerful, all-everything, all-knowing God has to be. And that's why the son has become man and did that simple, foolish thing of becoming your servant and dying on a cross. And that's why he brings you that cross, that very salvation, unable for you to grasp in the past, to you present, today, right now, that you might hear it in your simple ears and feel it on your little foreheads and taste it on your finite tongues. Now the big, bold, impossible to understand triune God is proclaimed and watered and fed to you in the person of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Amen.